so I'll spend the next uh, 15 minutes or so um, giving you a brief update of where we are with prospective head movement correction for fMRI um, at the CVU. So some of you, if you've been around long enough, you will have seen this data, but there's lots of new imaging uh, faces at the CVU and in Cambridge more generally that I thought it was a good time to um, um, kind of give a new update on this, particularly because we had a big gap in the middle where nothing happened. Uh, so I'm just going to be giving an overview of what we've done um, and uh, where we are and what we're going to do next. So I'll start off by giving a brief introduction to prospective move motion correction, in particular the system that I've been using. Um, uh, we'll start off by telling you some of the impacts of MRI um, uh, after head movement. I'll talk about prospective motion correction with optical tracking. Then I'll briefly mention um, a 70 fMRI validation study we ran a few years ago, uh, and then I'll tell you where we are now after what I, like I said, um, a, a very long gap uh, where we weren't able to do much. So, um, prospective motion correction or PMC. Uh, most of you in the room, if you do work with MRI, you will be aware that there are lots of consequences of head movement in MRI. So we might see some ghosting. So there's some examples of that here, for example, in the back of the brain there, we see uh, a little bit like um, a double of the image appearing and that can also be visible in striping across the brain there. And another very common impact uh, is the loss of resolution. So we see that the images come out blurry or, or smoothed out. We can also have slice mismatching and this will be particularly uh, problematic for things like fMRI or diffusion MRI where the two slices or three or however many slices may be completely mismatched uh, which means the voxels don't longer, no longer match up and we need to apply some form of correction before the data can be used. If this is very extreme, if the movement is very extreme and we're collecting high resolution data, usually we have quite small acquisition boxes so in the extreme case you can also lose data because the brain might move outside of your acquisition box. So the region that you're interested in, if it was relatively close to the boundary, may suddenly be um, cut off a little bit. And another classic effect are spin history effects uh, due to through plane movement. So that's the sort of striping pattern that you can see here. So all of these stripes down the brain reflect that uh, movement through, um, through the plane. So certainly for fMRI or diffusion techniques where we have multiple volumes, the classic way of correcting for this is realignment. So we just use rigid body uh, registration to put the uh, slices back into their right place as much as possible. But obviously issues related to spin history, um, which led to the striping here, uh, cannot be corrected. So those signal dropouts um, happen because of spin history. The data, the signal was not collected. We're not going to recover it just because we put the brain back where it was. So what should we do? Ideally, we would be correcting for this at the time of acquisition. So one of the options to do that um, is to use an optical camera system uh, for prospective motion correction. The one we have here uh, was um, developed by a company called Kinetical, no longer in business. Uh, so the way this works is we put a camera inside the scanner ball. Uh, and then this camera can track up to two moire phase markers. If you do not know what a moire phase marker is, I've put a picture of it here. It's basically made up of lots of really thin uh, layers of glass. It's really reflective. And all those patterns as you move the marker uh, really, really change the, the, the type of uh, image. And that's what the camera tracks. So it can track those changes. And uh, it gets five degrees of freedom um, for movement from those patterns. And the sixth degree uh, of freedom it gets from the size of the marker, so the distance between the marker and, uh, uh, and the camera. So your Z coordinate, if you like, is mostly uh, related to the size of the marker. Uh, one of the big advantages of this system is that there is no additional scan time uh, required, so it affects the sequence in no way whatsoever. This is kind of just happening uh, on the sidelines. Uh, the only thing that it does come with a little bit of increased setup time because there's more equipment in the scanner, etc. But that's just at the start of the um, of the scan. Then during the acquisition itself, everything is normal. And then what the camera does is to collect um, information on the position of the head. Uh, it can uh, collect information every 12 milliseconds and then that information can be fed onto the scanner and before each um, uh, excitation pulse we can adjust the position of the field of view. So basically you set up your box in the beginning and then the box follows the head as it moves, uh, resulting in um, uh, data that, is, uh, that, that has no movement artifact or fewer movement artifact at least. So this is um, the setup. So there's the camera up there inside the scanner. Uh, this is a, a cartoon showing the setup on the 70. Uh, and there's the uh, participant down there. And then uh, the only thing we haven't talked about is uh, how do we attach this marker to the person so that the camera can track it. 
So the manufacturer will tell you just put it anywhere on the tip of the nose, on the face, but I'll show you some data on how that doesn't really work. Um, so both ourselves and, and many others using this system have long ago decided the only way to do it is to do it through dental attachment, because obviously our teeth are the only thing rigidly attached to the bone, top teeth at least. Um, so that's the closest we can get to following the movements of the, of, of the brain accurately. Um, the um, people, the, the kind of groups who started using this uh, dental attachment, particularly a group, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, Magdeburg in Germany, uh, they very early uh, started sending their participants to the dentist and getting dentist-made mouthpieces. But that was never going to be an option for us in Cambridge, um, if for no other reason, because the university does not have a dentistry department or orthodontics department, so we would have had to interact with a private clinic, and that was just never going to work. They're also very, very expensive, um, so we, we never went down this path uh, for, for marker attachment. So what did we do? Uh, so like I said, after our very early tests, we saw that attachment to the skin doesn't really work, right? My face is moving, my brain isn't necessarily moving in correlation with my face. Uh, so that was actually causing more artifacts than um, uh, doing any good. So we went with off-the-shelf solutions. So we initially used this dental putty. It comes in two boxes. You kind of mix it up, uh, and then you get the person to bite onto it, and then it just hardens, and uh, it um, keeps the shape of the teeth. So I've got one uh, here. Uh, and these are all materials that are safe to use, used in um, dentist offices, etc. And then we just had to 3D print some bits so we could attach to it and the marker would go there. So uh, this was a very kind of rudimentary off-the-shelf option, but we decided to test it nonetheless. And so one of the first things we tried was to compare this solution with uh, uh, putting the, um, the marker just on the cheek, as the manufacturers had suggested. And what you see here are the um, movement parameters uh, for the residual movement left in the images, okay? So there are two attachments, cheek on the left and mouthpiece on the right, uh, and then there are two conditions where we ask the participant to move, specifically nod rhythmically, and down here where we ask them to stay as still as they possibly could. So you can see uh, straight away that if we use uh, um, cheek attachment, uh, we've got uh, residual movement that is much greater in amplitude compared to the mouthpiece attachment. Mouthpiece, if somebody is nodding, obviously it's never going to give you a perfect correction because by the time the camera corrects, the, the head has already moved out of place again. So it was never going to be perfect, but you do see reduced um, uh, amplitude of the, of the correction there. But it is much, much better when the mouthpiece is attached to the teeth. So uh, in this case, there is no, no movement with a cheek attachment. There's still quite a lot of residual movement being picked up. All of that uh, is, is, is corrected um, with, with a dental attachment. So if you like, this is the, the classic. You've told your subject not to move much at all. And if you correct, you end up with data that doesn't really show signs of, of, of movement at all. The other good thing about using this uh, setup that we saw was that on the raw camera uh, movement parameters, so this is just the Y uh, translation component uh, coming straight out of the camera, no preprocessing whatsoever, is that we can clearly, very, uh, we can clearly see um, rhythmic movement up and down, and that's consistent with breathing. And if you zoom in, you can also see higher frequency uh, blips, uh, which after Fourier transform, we can see uh, the peak for breathing up there uh, consistent with 18 breaths per minute, and we see another little peak down there, which we think is heart rate. So it looks like even with this kind of off-the-shelf setup, we were able to uh, pick up all of this information from the uh, tracking parameters from the camera. So we were very happy, and we went ahead and ran a full um, 3T fMRI study looking at whether we would be able to improve classification accuracy in an MPPA study if we corrected uh, with prospective movement correction. So very briefly, this was the experimental setup. There were 18 participants, and they each came back for three sessions. In the first one, we had the mouthpiece on, and we were correcting their data. In the second session, the uh, mouthpiece was present, but we were not correcting. And in the third condition, they had nothing. No camera, no mouthpiece, just the kind of, this is your classic fMRI experiment. The reason why we had this, these three conditions, is because we wanted to check whether the presence of the marker would make them move more, and then perhaps some of the movement we were correcting was the movement we created in the first place. Uh, it was a 2D PI sequence using very standard setup here at the CVU, and we tried two different resolutions, 3 millimeters, which is very standard at 3T, and 1.5, which is kind of pushing it for, for gradient echo at 3T, but still um, uh, achievable. 
Um, we had two runs of functional localizers, so we had some uh, ROIs to analyze, and we also had some resting state to do some classic TSNR calculations. So these were the stimuli we used. So th these are the main, uh, the stimuli for the main experiment, just gratings. The, uh, what we were trying to do was to check whether in our regions of interest we would be able to um, uh, classify the voxel pattern between these two <coughs> orientations. Uh, to define our regions of interest, we had lots of other stimuli for classic retinotopic mapping, and uh, these ones up here, which allowed us to define on-axis and off-axis patch pairs. If you're interested in more detail, please check the, uh, the paper. I'm just going to briefly show you the results. So remember what we were trying to do is check what is our ability, ability to uh, differentiate between these two gratings, these two orientations. And here we've got the data three millimeters on the left and 1.5 millimeter on the right. And the three millimeters, we didn't really find much of an effect of uh, correcting with PNC. The voxels are quite big. Uh, all of these participants hadn't moved very much. They, they were uh, fairly well behaved. So we found that if you tell your participants to stay very still, to be honest, that's fine. That's good enough. But when we went into slightly higher resolution at 1.5, we started to see an effect of PMC. So the PMC with correction, the first session, is the dark blue there. And we were getting higher classification accuracies. I mean, in this case, they are um, um, T discriminant um, metrics, but you can think about them as, as classification accuracies. And we were seeing that correcting, using PMC for correction, did indeed result in uh, an improvement compared to uh, doing nothing or um, uh, having a, just doing your realignment, not doing nothing. We, we did apply realignment for all of them. So what this seemed to suggest was that, um, yes, at three millimeter, probably this is like using you know, a bazooka to try and kill a fly. But if we're going into higher resolution, this starts to become important. But another thing we saw was that if we looked at the movement parameters alone, so if you just focus on, these, on this side of the graph for a minute, so these are the SPM realignment parameters. So these measure the uh, residual amount of motion still present in the images that were collected. And you do see that it is much, much lower uh, for both resolutions in the case where we did correct. So the correction was working in both uh, cases. But the important comparison was between these two. So these were the visits where the mouthpiece was present, but we weren't correcting, and the mouthpiece was not present at all. And what we saw was that on the days when the mouthpiece was present, participants moved significantly more than when the mouthpiece was not there. So we are introducing noise movement with our bulky mouthpiece. So overall, what we found was that PMC does improve data quality and classification accuracies, especially for the higher resolutions. But the presence of the mouthpiece increased overall movement. So we had clearly two different types of movement in our data. The mouthpiece induced motion, which was rare, sudden, and large in magnitude, which we started calling the swallowing reflex. I think we think that's what was happening. Got something bulky in your mouth, you're more likely to be swallowing. Uh, and then we had the inherent subject motion that was present, uh, even in the days when the mouthpiece wasn't there, which is a little bit more consistent, slow and smaller in magnitude, so the kind of the drift-like movement parameters that we're used to seeing. So after all this, we decided, right, so we want to do higher resolution fMRI to do the sorts of things that uh, Datsa was just talking about at 7T. We'll be at submillimetric resolutions where uh, if this is important at 1.5, it's likely to be even more important at 0 0.8 where even the best uh, well-behaved subject will end up moving um, uh, at least up to half a millimeter, if not more. So we were preparing for that, but then the COVID pandemic happened and we weren't allowed to do any scanning initially. And even when we were allowed to do scanning, we weren't allowed to put things in people's mouths. So we just had a really, really long break. So where are we now? So this is a problem. We cannot use this uh, marker attachment anymore. We needed to find an alternative solution. We cannot send them to the dentist. Um, we still needed something that we could do here. So Marius, one of our radiographers, found uh, these 3D dental scans that orthodontists are starting to use in their offices. It turns out we could get one relatively cheap because we're an educational facility. So um, licenses and everything were much cheaper. So um, a dental scanner we got. And these are the dental mouthpieces that we're now producing. So they're very, very small, uh, custom made for every participant. I've got one in my hand compared to the bulky one. If anyone wants to have a look, come and find me after. And so yeah, these just fit perfectly uh, to the teeth. The attachment is very, very strong. And they, you can feel them, obviously. There's something uh, around your teeth. 
but they don't cause you to swallow excessively, for example. So we believe this will allow us to solve our swallowing problem. So we're rebuilding everything back from uh, scratch. First, you start with calibration and quality control. So after reinstalling the system, recalibrating it, uh, these are the images that we're getting for a phantom without doing any motion correction and after doing motion correction. Now, there should be no difference whatsoever between these images, right? The phantom is not moving. So if the system was poorly calibrated, uh, even though the phantom is not moving, it would pick up on random noise and it would introduce random noise into the sequence and we would see a difference. But we do not see a difference. So there's a, a histogram of the TSNR values for um, uh, the, the phantom with PMC on and PMC off and we see uh, no difference at all. So this is all great and very encouraging and what we want to be seeing. So we're recently starting <coughs> scanning humans again. So again, we want to do the same thing with the human brain. So if there is no active movement, ideally, uh, this shouldn't be making too much of a difference. But if we see a difference, we would want the PMC to be helping, not uh, making a mess of it. So if we look at the uh, movement parameters without correction and with correction, again, without correction, we see the traditional slow drift um, uh, in the head movements. With PMC on, everything is pretty much flat, so not much residual movement at all in the corrected images. And this was, again, with the subject told to be as still as possible. Uh, if we look at TSNR maps, PMC off, here it is, PMC on, you immediately see, even visually, that PMC on is starting to look uh, brighter. So we have better TSNR values if we do correct, even in the case where they were told to stay as still as possible. If I do the same thing with the histogram, uh, initially you don't see much of a difference. Um, there's perhaps tiny little bits of a shift, a positive shift of the orange histogram, suggesting slightly higher TSNR values with the motion correction on. But actually, it took me a while to realize this, but this is actually the TSNR in the, in the background noise. So if I zoom in, <laughs> this is what you see. And so without any active movement, you can clearly see that the TSNR of the corrected data is shifted towards the right, so better signal-to-noise ratio when we do correct. Um, <coughs> we then asked the participant to nod. So this, was, this is my brain. I was nodding rhythmically up and down all the way through. Uh, I'm applying the same thresholds on TSNR that I was applying for the previous images. So you see in the nodding case, uh, without correction, parts of the brain are completely gone. They have as good as TSNR as the, as the background noise. Uh, if I do PMC on, a lot more of the brain is still there. And again, if we look at a histogram, this is the background peak. The peak we're interested in is that one there. So let me zoom in. And again, we see after motion correction, the TSNR histogram is uh, notably shifted towards the right where the higher SNR values are. So everything seems to be uh, working. The new dental mouth piece, nobody's complained so far, seems to be fairly comfortable. Um, and the system seems to be well calibrated. So where are we going with this? So we're going back to the 7T. So we've got uh, funding for a pilot study looking at laminar fMRI with motion correction. So we want to see what difference does it make in the quality of the data that we get and in the laminar profiles if we correct for uh, uh, movement, involuntary movement. We're not going to tell anybody to nod in the 7T in case you were wondering. Uh, also planning to investigate the benefits of um, uh, doing this at 3T with special populations who are more likely to move. So these are children or patients with movement disorders, um, for example. We didn't find that big a benefit for cognitive um, neuroscience studies at three millimeters, but for populations that are more likely to move, this might suddenly become a lot more important. And the main reason why I wanted to do this presentation today, any other ideas? Anybody who thinks this might be relevant, important for the particular studies you're interested in, come and talk to me. The system is uh, set up and ready to go. Thank you very much.